Hello, good morning, and welcome to this, the fifth session in the Inquirer series. Today, we're going to look at vestments, priests' vestments specifically, and their meaning. We are also going to have some practical advice on what to do when you enter an Orthodox church for the first time, because we do all sorts of things and it can seem a little strange. And when in Rome and all that, actually, that is a phrase that is very pertinent as it has a church connection, exactly this sort of church connection. The origin of the saying, when in Rome, etc., is traceable to the fourth century AD when St. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, offered some wise words to St. Augustine when he moved to Milan to take up a role as a professor of rhetoric. St. Augustine found that unlike in his previous church in Rome, the congregation didn't fast on Saturdays and this disturbed him. St. Ambrose said, when I go to Rome, I fast on Saturday, but here I do not. Do you also follow the custom of whatever church you attend, if you do not want to give or receive scandal? St. Augustine later wrote this advice in a letter, so allowing us to pinpoint the origins of the expression to a particular event in history. In the final section, we will look at the preparation of the holy gifts running into the liturgy, which is called the proscomedia, which is actually a separate little service before the, the, the main liturgy, though you wouldn't know it if you were just in church being part of the congregation. Uh, and this is, this is running in ahead of, of next week where we're going to look at the liturgy more closely. So, quite a lot to cover. Uh, let's begin. We'll begin proceedings with an explanatory video from the Greek Archdiocese in America. The clothing or the uniforms we wear help identify us to others. The roles we play, the jobs we do, the status we have in an organization or group. In the Orthodox Church, the same applies. Our clergy, deacons, priests, and bishops wear distinct items that identify them to one another and to the faithful. Some of the items are the same, but each rank of the clergy wear different items that are distinct to their rank. We're going to show you these vestments, as we call them, and how each order of the priesthood wears them, what they signify, and the prayers they recite as they place each one of them on before they celebrate the services of the church. Usually, the clergy put on their vestments behind the altar, unseen, but so we can show you what they wear and talk about each garment, they are vesting on the soleus. We're going to begin with the vestments of a deacon. Welcome, Deacon Athanasios. These are the vestments he wears at the Divine Liturgy and many other church services. The stichadion, the epimanikia or cuffs, and the orarion. These vestments developed over many centuries, but basically they were the regular garments worn by men in the Roman and Byzantine empires. They would be simpler in decoration for day-to-day -day life, but those who worked near the emperor needed to be more richly decorated. The church adopted these for the clergy. By the sixth century, the basic pattern of what vestments looked like was set and hasn't changed all that much since. The first garment he puts on is the stichadion, or tunic. A tunic was the most common garment worn by people in the Roman Empire. Deacons, priests, and bishops all wear a stichadion. But in the case of the deacon, because it is so visible, it is the most richly decorated. Because of the decoration, some people think that it is the model for the sakos that the bishop wears. Next, the deacon will put on his cuffs, in Greek called epimanikia, meaning over the hands. These are very practical because they keep the sleeves under the stichadion in place. Cuffs were commonly worn in the Roman Empire too. 
he'll place the right cuff on with one prayer and the left with another. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Grant me understanding that I may learn from your commandments. Always, now, and forever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. The last garment the deacon will put on is the orarion. This is unique to deacons. It is basically a very long scarf that he places over his left shoulder and around his body. Wearing this, everyone knows he's a deacon. When he says parts of the liturgy, he will hold one end of the orarion in his right hand and hold that hand up for all to see. In the Roman Empire, when someone had something important to say and needed to be noticed, he would hold his hand up. We see that in statues of important Romans. For practical reasons, the deacon will wrap the orarion around himself to keep it in place when he receives and distributes Holy Communion. Now the deacon is ready to serve the liturgy. Let's see the vestments of a priest. Welcome Father Nicholas. Father Nicholas is already wearing the vestments that he shares with the deacon. He said the same prayers too. The priest's tichadion isn't as fancy because it is worn under everything else and not very visible. Some say the stichadion reminds us of the white tunic that a newly baptized person would wear. This is the epitirhilion, or stole. In some ways, it is an orarion that is worn around the neck and buttoned in front, but shorter. But what's important is that it is the mark of a priest in the church. He wears the epitirhilion at all services that he conducts. It is the piece that says he's a priest. Next, he'll place the zoni, which means belt. It has a very practical function, holding everything in place. Some priests wear the epigonation. The word means on the knee because of where it rests when he places it on. It is an award that a priest can receive, showing an additional rank or responsibility, like that of confessor. The Philonion. This garment, the Philonion, is interesting because St. Paul tells Timothy to collect his Philonion. In that passage, it means coat or cloak, so we think St. Paul forgot it at someone's house or that he lent it to someone. But this reminds us that the cloak is the origin of this vestment of a priest. In the icons, many of the clergy are wearing what looks like a felonion, but seems much longer in front. The felonion used to be much longer, hanging down to the knees. Remember, it was worn as a cloak, like a poncho, with designs that said, this is a priest. But over time, to make the garment more useful, the Orthodox shortened the front. Roman Catholic clergy wear something very similar, still long in front. When the priest puts the garment on, he says a prayer. Always, now, and forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Some priests also wear a jeweled cross, but we'll look at that with the bishop's vestments. Now the priest is ready to serve the liturgy. Finally, we are going to see the vestments of a bishop. Welcome your grace, Bishop Demetrius of Xanthos. His grace is wearing the vestments that he shares with the deacon and the priest. Like them, he puts these on first and says the same prayers that they say. He'll place his epigonation on a bit later, but it is the same piece as a priest. This is called a sakos. It is a very large vestment, frequently made of heavy and very ornate fabric, requiring help to put it on and fasten it. Some think that only the highest ranking bishops, patriarchs mainly, would wear this garment. 
but originally a bishop would wear merely a philonion with many crosses on it. The sacos resembles a deacon stichadion, but it also resembles a garment that the emperor would wear. In the case of a bishop, it clearly is one of the main signs of his office, connecting him to his authority within the church. Over time, it seems that all bishops began to wear the sacos. At this point, the bishop places his epigonatio. Upon your thigh, Almighty One, and your splendor and beauty, string your bow. Prosper and reign because of truth, meekness, and righteousness. Your right hand shall lead you wondrously, always, now, and forever, into the ages of ages. Amen. Like the deacon and priest, the bishop wears a large scarf that shows his office. It is called an omophorion. It is much larger than the deacon's and worn over the shoulders very differently. We can see this in the icons. In the 7th century, St. Isidore said that this is a symbol of a sheep that the bishop carries over his shoulders, reminding him and everyone that his task is that of shepherd. For that reason, the omophorion is usually white and decorated with crosses. The large omophorion is rather cumbersome. He needs help even putting it on. But because it can make certain actions of the liturgy more difficult for him, it developed to be more practical. Then, over time, a smaller version developed. It's called the small omophorion. During the divine liturgy, just before the gospel reading, the bishop removes the great omophorion out of respect for the gospel and in recognition that Christ is present in the reading. After the gospel, he will place the small omophorion around his shoulders for the remainder of the liturgy. A bishop will wear a pectoral cross and an engolpion. The cross will have an icon of the crucifixion of Christ. Some priests may wear this cross too. The engolpion is round with an icon on it. The icon is often the Virgin Mary, but it could be a saint or a feast day. The prayers, which are verses from scripture, remind all of us of our responsibilities as Christians. I himself take up this cross and follow me. Let us pray to the Lord, create in me a clean heart, O God, a renew and right spirit within me, always, now, and forever, into the ages of ages. Amen. Bishops wear a crown called a mitre. It is one of the last vestments that bishops began to wear. For centuries, bishops did not wear this, with just one or two exceptions. But in the late 15th century, all bishops began to wear the mitre. It is a sign of the bishop's authority in the church. He also carries a staff. It serves as a reminder of the bishop's role as a shepherd. In the Western Church, Bishops seem to have used the staff very early, but in the Orthodox Church, bishops began to carry this staff around the same time as they began to wear the mitre. It's unique in that there is a two-headed snake or dragon under the sign of the cross. It can seem to mean a few things, the church and state and their relationship under God. It also looks like the sign of a medical doctor, reminding us of healing. We often see bishops with these items as well. The first is the mandia. It is a long, vividly colored cloak the bishop wears when serving from the bishop's throne. This is a cloak. Monks wear very simple versions of this, usually black. But the bishop's is much fancier and colorful, a sign of his office in the church. These are candlesticks. The three candles remind us of the Holy Trinity. The two remind us of the divine and human natures of Christ. The bishops use these to bless people. They remind us that all Christians are to be the light of the world. People of high rank in the imperial court of the Byzantines would have candles carried near them. Once all the clergy have put on their vestments, they are ready to celebrate the divine liturgy. They will take their positions according to their rank. Because of their garments, everyone will know who they are 
and the role they play in the Divine Liturgy. Thank you, Your Grace, Bishop Demetrius, Father Nicholas, and Deacon Athanasios for sharing this beautiful part of our Orthodox Christian tradition. One thing you will notice when you're in an Orthodox church is that priests do a lot of blessing of things and of people with the sign of the cross and that people themselves make the sign of the cross upon themselves. And also, possibly most notably, we do it differently from Roman Catholics who cross themselves. We begin at the forehead where we say, Lord, and go to the stomach where we say, Jesus Christ. And then we go to the right shoulder, where we say, Son of God. And to the left shoulder, have mercy on us, followed usually by a bow, and to the ground during Great Lent. The history of this goes a long way back. Peter of Damascus in the 12th century said of it, the use of the right hand betokens his finite power and the fact that he sits at the right hand of the Father that the sign begins with a downward movement from above signifies his descent to us from heaven. Again, the movement of the hand from the right side to the left drives away our enemies and declares that by his invincible power, the Lord overcame the devil, who is on the left side, dark and lacking in strength. Athanasius of Alexandria in the third, fourth century AD and Peter of Damascus in the 12th century said something along these lines. By the signing of the holy and life-giving cross, devils and various scourges are driven away. For it is without price and without cost and praises him who can say it. The holy fathers have by their words transmitted to us and even to the unbelieving heretics how the two raised fingers and the single hand reveal Christ our God in his dual nature but single substance. The right hand proclaims his immeasurable strength, his sitting on the right hand of the Father and his coming down to us from heaven. Again, by the movement of the hands to our right, the enemies of God will be driven out as the Lord triumphs over the devil with his inconquerable power rendering him dismal and weak. And you will notice from the picture that both the priest and the people gather the thumb and first two fingers together to represent the Trinity. And the other two fingers are bent down and represent the two natures of Christ. So everything about the sign of the cross, about blessing, is about our understanding of God, our theology of the Trinity and of Christ's humanity and divinity. When do we make the sign of the cross? Whenever all three persons of the Trinity are alluded to. So whenever we say the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, we make the sign of the cross. In the Creed, when we say, I believe in one God, and in the Lord Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Spirit, in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and the life of the world to come. At all of those points, we make a sign of the cross. When a priest or deacon senses you, you also can make the sign of the cross. Before you begin any prayer, no matter how short it is, when you enter the church and as an unsaid prayer for God's blessing, for instance, at the beginning of a journey. Also, of course, before you venerate an icon, you will cross yourself twice, venerate the icon and then cross yourself a third time. 
Remember the faith. Perhaps the essential element of the sign is that it physically indicates the direct relevance of the cross, of the sacrifice of Jesus to one's person or surroundings. It is an engagement of the body that affirms what the faith professes. It is also a sign to others of what one professes. Tertullian wrote in the second century, at every forward step and movement, at every going in and out, when we put on our clothes and shoes, when we bathe, when we sit at table, when we light lamps, on couch, on seat, in all the ordinary actions of life, we trace upon the forehead the sign of the cross. In other words, we pray unceasingly and everything we do, we ask God's blessing. We can also, of course, make the sign of the cross in the air to bless objects. And a small cross may be traced, for example, on the forehead. For example, if one's saying goodnight to one's child, you can give them a blessing on the forehead in that way before they go to sleep. Again, as you will see, as depicted in the icon, Christ blesses with three fingers together and, and two, just as I described before. And this is how the priest blesses you. The index finger represents Christ's divinity. The middle finger represents his humanity. The bending of the middle finger may be interpreted that he bowed the heavens and came down to earth for our salvation. So it's slightly different uh, combination of fingers to one's personal blessing on oneself, but the representation is still the same. When a priest is blessing the congregation, it is Christ blessing us, so we do not cross ourselves at that point. When we cross ourselves, we are effectively calling God's blessing down upon ourselves. When you enter the temple, it is customary to venerate holy icons. When venerating or kissing an icon, pay especial attention to where you kiss it. It is not proper to kiss an icon on the face. After all, you wouldn't go up and kiss the Lord or his mother on the lips, would you? Instead, you would kiss their hand. Pay attention to what you are doing. When you approach an icon to venerate it, kiss the gospel, scroll or hand cross in the hand of the person depicted, or kiss the hand or foot. The hands and feet on some icons are covered with metal for this purpose, so as not to dam damage the icon itself. As you venerate an icon, show the proper respect due to the person depicted, the same deference you would show them in person. Remember to blot off that lipstick first. If an icon is not very accessible, then you can kiss your right hand and touch the icon in place of kissing it directly. You will see on the slide some further guidance. There are also some other small matters of etiquette when you're in an Orthodox church. You stand whenever the priest comes out of the sanctuary during, the, during sensing litanies for the Lord's Prayer and for the Creed, for the threefold Gloria and for the little and great entrances that is when the priest comes out with the gospel book first and processes around and then comes out with the sacramental elements and processes around. You do this unless you are unwell or unable to stand. If you are sitting to listen to the epistle then you never cross your legs and you never cross your legs in any way while sitting in church or stand with your hands in your pockets or your arms behind your back. This really is akin to lounging about in front of the Queen. One must always remember in whose presence one is. When you receive a personal blessing from a priest or bishop, you make a metania. You bow down and touch the ground with the right hand. You then cup your hands in front of you and once you've received your blessing, you kiss the hand of the priest, you hold your hand open like a cup so it receives the blessing as you would receive water to drink, which is actually a lovely thought because you're holding your blessing in your hand.
on occasion on days Monday through to Saturday and during Lent we do make prostrations, full prostrations and it's useful to know how to do that. We don't ever make a full prostration on a Sunday because that's the day of the resurrection. But here is a little video to show you how to make a prostration. This is a low bow or a poklon with the Jesus prayer. You're going to make the sign of the cross and as you're finishing the cross you're going to bow down so that your right hand and your knee are either touching or very, very close together. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. A prostration is just to take that farther. You make the sign of the cross. As you're finishing the cross, you do a prostration. St. Paisius teaches that you can do it with your fists instead of with your hands open. I'm not sure why, but he says that. And also, your hands should be relatively close to your knees and your forehead should be relatively close or touching the ground and close to your knees, not all spread out. So like this. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. God bless you. You will quite often see during a church service that there are people standing with prayer ropes quietly moving them on not to not to not. You'll most often find monks and nuns doing this, but ordinary people do it as well. Prayer ropes are made in keeping with a tradition whose origin is lost in antiquity. Perhaps one of the earliest forms was simply gathering small pebbles or seeds and moving them from one spot or container to another as a person said their prayer rule or carried out their practice of bows and prostrations. The story is told of a monk who decided to make knots in a rope, which he could use in carrying out his daily rule of prayer. But the devil kept untying the knots he made in the rope, frustrating the poor monk's efforts. Then an angel appeared and taught the monk a special kind of knot that consists of ties of interlocked crosses. And these knots the devil was unable to unravel. Prayer ropes come in a great variety of forms and sizes. Most prayer ropes have a cross woven into them or attached to mark the end and also have some kind of marker after each 10, 25 or 50 knots or beads. There are many forms of prayer ropes. Most are knotted and of black wool or silk. Some are made of beads. The black colour symbolises repentance. There are two ways we can pray using the prayer rope. We can use it at any time of day, quietly. We just sit and hold the prayer rope with our left or right hand and move from knot to knot with our thumb, whispering the Jesus prayer or most holy Theotokos save us or Saint Gabriel, your prayers for Sarah or John or George, whoever you might be praying for. So it can be used for intercession, for yourself, for others. It's, it's for any prayer you want to use, really, to keep count of the number of times you're saying it. But it's usually short little prayers, such as illustrated here. Then also at any time of our regular prayer, following our rule of prayer, we hold the prayer rope as above and move from knot to knot. At the beginning, with our right hand, we make the sign of the cross over ourselves. And then we say the Jesus prayer. When we finish with all the knots of the prayer rope, we carry on from the beginning again with the same procedure for as many times as our spiritual father has advised. And now we move on to the proscomedia and what it is all about. Uh, it is the preparation of the bread for communion and is a little pre-service service, really, but you wouldn't notice it as a separate service nowadays as it just goes on while everything else is going on. So we're going to watch this video, as I mentioned earlier, ahead of next week, because we're going to look more deeply and closely at the Eucharist.
The proskomidi service is the service where the priest prepares the bread and the wine that will be offered to God and become Holy Communion in the Divine Liturgy. We also call the service of preparation the prothesis. This service takes place privately in the sanctuary before the liturgy begins. For the first seven or eight centuries of the church, there was no special service. But over the centuries, a complex series of actions began to be performed on the bread and wine combined with Bible verses, commemorations, and prayers. This came about when thinkers in the church were connecting moments in the liturgy to events in the life of Christ. By the 10th century, the service as we know it today came to be. Interestingly, most often the proskomidi is associated symbolically with the Nativity of Christ. The icon that is most often found in the prothesis is the Nativity icon. But when the Amnos, that is the piece of bread that will be consecrated as the body of Christ is prepared, the main theme of the Bible verses and prayers is the sacrifice of Christ, the passion, the cross, the death, and how they bring about the salvation of the world. This is also why we find the icon of the extreme humility in the apse. But the nativity will also be mentioned. So we have two themes being presented to us in the service, the birth of Christ and his death. Before the 8th or 9th centuries, people would bring their gifts to the deacons who were stationed in the Skevophilakion, a building in the northeast corner of the church complex. Then at the appropriate time in the divine liturgy, the deacons would carry the gifts to the altar table in a simple version of what would later become the great entrance. By the 10th century, the preparations of the gifts shifted to a small nook or apse in the sanctuary and the service began to take shape. People still brought their gifts, but the transfer became the great entrance. We've set up a table outside the sanctuary for Father Nicholas to perform the service of the proskomidi for us so that it's easier for the cameras to work. The priest makes the sign of the cross over the loaf of bread that will be used. As many as five loaves of bread can be used, but most priests use only one. As a sheep, he was Then the priest the begins to cut the amnos, the lamb, the part of the bread marked with I-C-X-C-N-I-K-A. Jesus Christos Nika. As a blameless lamb done before his shear, he opens not his mouth. With each cut into the loaf of bread, he recites an Old Testament verse. We can hear the theme of the sacrifice of Christ. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? With this, he can lift the amnos out of the bread. For his life is raised up from the earth. He will also make two sharp cuts in the bread to make it easier to break later. Then he does something that has no practical purpose, but reminds us of the passion of Christ. It was the last act of Christ's sacrifice when the soldier pierced his side. He pierces the corner marked, I see. Then as the scripture says, out poured blood and water. And the priest pours the wine and some water into the chalice and blesses them. Blessed is the union of your holy gifts. Then the priest begins a series of commemorations removing portions from the loaf or the other loaves. 
By the end of this, Christ will be surrounded by his church, the Theotokos, the angels and saints, the living and the dead. As Saint Simeon, the new theologian, once wrote, and this is the great mystery, God among men and God in the midst of gods. The first piece, and it is the largest, is for the Theotokos, the Virgin Mary. It shows her importance. It sits to the right of the Amnos. In deesis icons, as well as on the icon screen, Mary is in the same position. Then the priest removes nine smaller portions. In honor and remembrance of our archangels Michael and Gabriel, and of all of the heavenly bodiless powers. There are nine because there are nine orders of angels. And with each of the nine, a group of saints is remembered. In honor of the honorable, glorious prophet and foreigner, Saint John the Baptist, of the holy, glorious and prophet Moses and Aaron, Elias, Elijah, David and Jesse of the three holy children, of Daniel the prophet, and of all the holy prophets. Of our fathers among the saints, the universal great teachers, Basil the Great, Gregory the theologian, John Chrysostom, of Saints Athanasius and Cyril, Saint Nicholas of Myra, and of all of the holy hierarchs, of the holy proto-martyr and archdeacon Stephen, of the holy glorious and great martyrs George the Victorious, Dimitrios the Mirovlit, Theodore of Tiron, Theodore the Fatelatis, and of all of the holy martyrs. Of our father among the saints, John Chrysostom, Archbishop of Constantinople, whose liturgy we celebrate today. Then the priest begins to commemorate the living and the dead. Remember, loving master, every Orthodox Episcopate, our Archbishop Alexios. the honorable presbyters, the deacons in the service of Christ, and of all clergy, our brethren and co-celebrants, presbyters, deacons, and our brethren whom you, all good master, have called to your service through your compassion. Violet, Roxanne, George, Gabriel, Alicia, Nathan, Christian, Stephanie, Bobby, While in practice, a priest will use a sharp knife to prepare the different portions of the bread, he will also use a lance. It first started to be used in the 8th century. It reminds us again of the crucifixion of Christ, the spear that was used on Christ. It also recalls that this was a relic in Constantinople. Archbishop, Metropolitan Philip, and for all of the founders of this holy church. Lord, remember my unworthiness and forgive all of my transgressions, intentional and unintentional. Once all the commemorations are complete, the priest will cover the gifts. We offer to you incense, O Christ our God, as an offering of spiritual fragrance, accepted upon your heavenly altar, and send down upon us in return the grace of your all-holy spirit. He will bless the incense. Then he blesses the asterisk, as a star which means star, the with the incense, with and places this on the paten. 
The asterisk started to be used in the 11th century to keep the veils off the bread on the paten. Because it is a star, it reminds us of the star of Bethlehem. The star also refers to a verse from Psalm 33. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. The reference is because in Genesis, the firmament is over the earth. The Lord then he places a veil the over them, the Lord is a practice that began the somewhere in the 12th to 14th centuries. The veils remind us of the swaddling clothes of the Lord at his birth, or the shroud he wore at his burial. Since we see that both themes are prominent in the Proscomidi, both understandings make sense. Your virtue has covered the heavens, O Christ, and the earth is full of your praise. And the veils remind us that these gifts have been dedicated to the Lord. Finally, the paten and chalice are covered by the ayer. Keeping with the two themes of the service, the ayer reminds us of the heavens that contained the star that shone over Bethlehem and the burial shroud of Christ. As a good and loving God. The Ayer eventually would become the Epitaphios, the shroud that we see on Good Friday, because it would be decorated with an icon of Christ being prepared for burial. He then senses the gifts. Blessed is Christ our God, who is thus well pleased. Glory to you, both now and forever and to the ages of ages. Amen. O God, our God, you sent the heavenly bread, the food for the whole world, our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, as Savior, Redeemer, and Benefactor, to bless us and sanctify us. Do bless this offering and accept it upon your heavenly altar. As a good and loving God, remember those who brought it and those for whom it was brought. Keep us blameless in the celebration of your divine mysteries. For sanctified and glorified is your most honorable and majestic name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and forever and to the ages of ages. Amen. He completes the service with a final blessing and prayer. With the gifts prepared, the priest will celebrate the divine liturgy. And now we come again to the homework page, which, as I said before, you can do all, none, or some of, depending on how you want to go. The suggestions for this week are that you learn to cross yourself and start practicing it, that you perhaps start venerating icons, and that you practice praying with a prayer rope. And now it's time to say goodbye. We have arrived at the bibliography again, which, as I said before, I hope will be useful to you in your further study. I wish you a blessed and happy week ahead and see you next Thursday at 10.30. Thank you so much for joining me. Bye for now.